Okay, so I do got quite a bit of slides to go through, so we'll get started. Thanks for that introduction, Ken, and don't worry, if you screw up, I'll let you know. All right. <clears throat> and uh, so first, um, just real quick, some of our objectives, we want to review, you know, some of the basic bacteria types. Um, you know, what we're not going to do today is just go through each indication and say, if you have you acquired pneumonia, we're going to give this antibiotic, that antibiotic. What I want to do today is build kind of a strong foundation because we truly have to understand what we're treating. We have to understand some of the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of medications, and especially um, antibiotics before we can, you know, really treat infections. Um, and then also I want to talk a little bit about um, some drug allergy and cross reactivity, specifically penicillin allergy, because this is the most common type of allergy that you're going to see with your patients in the emergency room. Um, and you're going to have to deal with it on a daily basis. Remember, antibiotics, don't do anything to treat a cold. And, you know, as we were kind of talking about earlier, you know, you guys are going to be in the emergency room. Your reimbursement is going to be based on press gaining scores. You're going to have patients come into the emergency room and really, you know, they want an antibiotic. They want amoxicillin. They want Leviquin, you know, to treat their infection. But, you know, to be honest with you guys, the majority of these patients who come into the emergency room with cough and runny nose, you know, it's probably a viral syndrome and you're just doing a disservice to your patients and the healthcare system in general by giving them an antibiotic. First of all, <clears throat> some different types of bacteria. So we've got our gram positive, we've got our gram negative, and we've got our, our atypical. Gram positive bacteria, they will show up blue or purple on a gram stain because they have a thick peptidoglycan layer in their cell wall. Okay, so when you apply that gram stain, it's kind of blue in color, and so that they're gonna show up you know, very blue. Uh, the gram negatives will show up red because during the gram staining process, you give a red saffron and dye um, kind of at the end, and so that kind of washes away um, some of the gram stain, but gram negative bacteria, they have this outer membrane that kind of protects um, the cell wall. And so by giving that red saffron and dye at the end of a gram stain, the outer membrane actually turns red. So your gram positive bacteria are gonna appear, you know, kind of blue, purple in our gram stain, gram negative are gonna be red, and then your atypical, they're actually colorless because they don't actually have any peptidoglycan in their cell wall. Looking at some of your different gram-positive bacteria, you've got your gram-positive cocci and your gram-positive bacilli, or rods. Um, some of your more common gram-positive cocci and clusters will be, at, be like coagulase-negative staph or staph aureus. Um, some of your gram-positive and chains, you got your alpha-hemolytic, beta-hemolytic strep, okay? You got your strep pneumo, you can also have enterococcus, and then less commonly some of your gram-positive rods, such as listeria. And then your gram negatives can even get, you know, more confusing. You got your glucose fermenters and, and, and your glucose non-fermenters, and you can have oxidase positive gram negative rods. A very common one is Pseudomonas. Um, and there's many different types of bacteria. It's not truly important that we get real into the details of this because that's why we have, you know, our lab and they can give us our our sensitivities here. Some of the more common phrases from the micro lab, so you have some preliminary um, results from the lab. So gram-positive cocci in clusters very commonly represents Staph aureus. Gram-positive cocci in chains could represent Streptococcus or Enterococcus. And gram-positive diplococci um, specifically usually represents Streptococcus pneumoniae, one of the most common uh, bugs that causes community-acquired pneumonia. And then again, oxidase positive gram negative rods can be pseudomonas. So how do we target bacterial cells versus human cells? Because we have to give a drug, a chemical that goes into your body and it attacks certain cells, bacterial cells, but you don't want it to attack your cells and be toxic. Okay, so human cells, first of all, we do not have a peptidoglycan cell wall layer. Um, so that's an ideal target for a lot of antibiotics. The outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, they actually have specific channels and porins that we actually design drugs and design antibiotics to attack these specific channels and porins. Um, so that's one way we can be more specific. Bacterial protein synthesis, they have different ribosomes, the 50S and 30S versus what we use as humans. And also, humans, we do not make our own folate. We absorb our folate from the diet, whereas bacteria, they synthesize their own folate. Okay, so folic acid metabolism and production is kind of another target we can use. And then DNA replication um, in bacteria is a little bit different than human, and they have, you know, some different enzymes, such as DNA gyrase. And um, here you can kind of get a little visual representation of the different antibiotics and where they work and how they target bacterial cells versus, versus human cells. 
And, um, you know, for example, we have a lot of antibiotics that target cell wall synthesis. Your, uh, your beta-lactams, you know, for example, penicillins and, and cephalosporins. Um, your trimethoprim, tri trimethoprim uh, folic acid metabolism. And, um, and then you have your other antibiotics, tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones that work more inside the cell. All right, now a little introduction to some antibiotic pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Um, every antibiotic has a very unique pharmacokinetic profile. And, you know, it, this is a very difficult, you know, and a very large um, concept if you really want to kind of learn everything, but to just kind of having a few basics to kind of learn and understand. And, you know, you'll kind of get the hang of whatever ER you end up in, your hospital will have a specific formulary, and you'll kind of get the, you know, get to know the certain drugs that you use all the time. You know, um, first thing I want to talk about is certain drugs have time-dependent killing, other drugs have concentration uh, dependent killing, and then other drugs actually have a little combination of both. Time-dependent killing antibiotics such as beta-lactams, the concentration actually doesn't matter, okay, because beta-lactam antibiotics they actually work on the cell wall, okay, so the cell wall of the bacteria is the outermost part, it's actually, it's right there already. So you don't need high concentrations of the drug, but you need the drug to be there for a long time, okay, so beta-lactam antibiotics are time-dependent killing, and that time that that concentration of the drug has to be above the MIC, um, has to be around 25 to, to uh, 50 percent of the dosing interval. So for example, if you're given zosin 3.375 grams every eight hours, you need that concentration of zosin to be above the MIC of the bacteria for at least four hours of each dosing interval or, you know, 12 hours out of the day. Next, concentration-dependent killing antibiotics. So for example, um, aminoglycosides like tobramycin and genomycin, you need a very high concentration because when you think about the mechanism of action of genomycin or tobramycin, they actually work on the ribosomes inside the cell. So if you know and understand that mechanism of action of an antibiotic, you know that you need to get a very high concentration to diffuse that antibiotic in the cell to work on the ribosomes that are very deep inside the bacterial cell. Okay, so genomycin, tobramycin, um, fluoroquinolones, those are concentration-dependent antibiotics. And um, to be, you know, to get a concentration that's effective for aminoglycosides, for example, you need a concentration that is about 8 to 12 times above the MIC of the bacteria. And aminoglycosides are actually have very poor lung tissue penetration. And so by giving, you know, a common two milligrams per kilo dose of genomycin, where if you use Epic and you, you know, you order genomycin, the automatic pop-up, you know, that's going to, dose that's going to give you is two milligrams per kilo, you're not going to be anywhere near getting a high enough concentration to truly treat a pneumonia, for example, if you're using genomycin or, or tobramycin. And then we have other antibiotics that actually a little bit more complicated and have a little bit combination of both concentration dependent and time dependent. So for ex example, vancomycin, um, the true measure of effectiveness of vancomycin is area under the curve to MIC, okay? So you have to have both high peaks because you need the drug to distribute and get to where you're treating the infection, but you also need, you know, some good time that that, MI that drug concentration above the MIC. Um, so the true measure of effectiveness for vancomycin is not peak levels, not trough levels, it's actually area under the curve. This is, you know, one of the areas where, you know, as clinical pharmacists is kind of where, you know, we do a lot of our job is kind of dosing and monitoring um, medications, you know. But in the emergency room, it's kind of nice because a lot of times we just got to give, you know, patients one-time dose. But it is important to kind of have this you know, general understanding because you need to give patients different doses depending on their indication. And trust me, in Northeast Ohio, giving patients one gram of vancomycin is not going to be enough for the majority of patients. <clears throat> Some more pharmacokinetics. Um, obviously, absorption, you know, that's when you take a tablet or a capsule, you know, by mouth, the, uh, the percent of the drug that gets absorbed. Um, if you give a medication IV, 100% of it gets absorbed, so you kind of bypass that absorption phase. And then distribution, or apparent volume of distribution is kind of what we call it. Um, for example, if you have one liter of 
water, okay, and you dump one gram of drug into that one liter of water, your volume distribution is going to be one gram per liter, okay? If you have, a, you know, a medication and you give one gram of medication into blood, which is like, let's say one liter just for good um, <clears throat> math here, your concentration is not going to be one gram per liter, okay? It's actually going to be way lower than that, like 200 milligrams per liter, okay? And the reason is because the drug distributes out of the circulation and into body tissues, okay? So each individual drug has a different apparent volume of distribution. And this is important because, for example, aminoglycosides have a very small volume of distribution, so they stay in the intravascular circulation a lot. So that tells you that you need to get pretty high doses if you want to get some of that drug out into tissues and lung tissue, for example. And then metabolism. Some antibiotics are uh, hepatically metabolized, but interestingly, a lot of antibiotics are actually excreted by the urine um, and renally cleared rather than hepatically cleared. And uh, so just a few clinical pearls. You know, you need to get active drug to the site of where you want to treat it. So for example, doxycycline or moxifloxacin, these drugs are hepatically metabolized. And they're not renally cleared. So you cannot treat a urinary tract infection with doxycycline or moxifloxacin because they don't get there as active drug, okay? Vancomycin is a very large um, peptide type antibiotic and if you give it orally, none of it gets absorbed, okay? So you can't treat any type of systemic infection with oral vancomycin, but you can use that to your advantage, okay? If you have a C. diff infection in your gut, okay, you can give vancomycin orally and it goes all the way down through and it can, you know, treat it. And then uh, daptomycin. Daptomycin is kind of a heavy-duty IV antibiotic to treat MRSA. Daptomycin is actually inhibited by lung surfactant. It kind of breaks it down. So you can't treat any type of pneumonia with daptomycin. And then metronidazole. Metronidazole has some very interesting pharmacokinetics. Uh, it actually concentrates very highly in the gallbladder, and then it's excreted into the GI tract. Okay, and then it kind of goes down the GI tract and it gets reabsorbed. And then it concentrates in the gallbladder again, and then gets excreted into the GI tract. This is called enterohepatic circulation. Okay, this is kind of interesting because you can give metronidazole IV or orally, you know, to treat an intra GI infection such as C. diff. And actually, metronidazole would be more effective to give it orally to treat C. diff. Um, <clears throat> but what else is interesting is. Um, you guys are going to see, I promise you're going to see a patient come in who's got a history of liver failure and they have a really high um, ammonia level. Okay, and one of the ways that we treat this is we actually give them an antibiotic like rifaximin or zifaxin, um, which actually kills off some of your normal gut flora, which is where a lot of these patients get um, their absorption of, of ammonia. And but if they have an extremely high ammonia level, like 220, they're going to be totally obtunded. They have esophageal varices. You don't want to put an NG tube down, and then you're going to order a uh, lactulose rectal enema, and your nurse is going to hate you. But something else you can do is you can actually give them IV flagyl. Because of this enterohepatic circulation, you can give an IV dose of flagyl that can help treat that hepatic encephalopathy. <clears throat> All right, and then um, some other kind of terms you're going to see. Um, that's becoming more common um, and just alphabetic soup here. You get MDR, multidrug resistant, MSSA versus MRSA. So methicillin sensitive versus methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, Visa versa hasn't really made its way to the United States yet, um, but it is kind of overseas a little bit. So that would be vancomycin intermediate, vancomycin resistant staph aureus. We're probably going to start to see that here in the next, you know, five or 10 years here in the United States. Um, drug resistant uh, strep pneumo, and then VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, KPC or, or uh, Klebsiella producing carbapenemase, and then CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. All right, now we're going to jump into specifically some antibiotic classes. First off, beta lactams. Um, all beta lactams, they share this kind of core beta lactam ring structure, which consists of a nitrogen here and then a carbon double bonded to an oxygen here. And this is actually kind of the active part of beta lactam antibiotics. This kind of opens up here and binds to these penicillin binding proteins of the bacterial cell wall. Okay, and then what kind of separates penicillins, for example, from, 
from cephalosporins and carbapenems is, you know, you have a little bit different ring structures over here, and then you can have different side chains here on carbon three, carbon six, carbon seven over here, and then you can get all of your different kind of antibiotics. <clears throat> first are narrow spectrum penicillins. So some of the first penicillins that came out, penicillin G, penicillin VK, okay? Typically speaking, when you start from early generation to late generation, the early first generation penicillin cephalosporins, they have more gram positive activity, okay? In the later generation that you get the newer antibiotics as uh, you get more gram negative coverage. Okay, so your narrow spectrum penicillins, they're gonna have great gram positive coverage such as, you know, strep and possibly some Staph aureus, but not MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. That's kind of the whole definition of it. Um, then your, your penicillinase resistant penicillin, so nafcillin, dicloxacillin. Um, nafcillin is kind of our new you know, version nowadays of, of methicillin, what that used to be. And um, you know, when we first came out with, with uh, Alexander Fleming invented penicillin back in 1927, you know, and it was just awesome. We treated everything and everybody with uh, penicillin, and, but a few years after we started seeing bacteria that were actually resistant to penicillin, um, and they started producing these, these penicillinases that would break down actual penicillin. Um, so we kind of came up with some new antibiotics that were resistant to these penicillinases that the bacteria were producing. And then late, later on down the generation, we've got our amino penicillin, so amoxicillin and ampicillin. You kind of start to get a little bit of gram-negative coverage with these, including E. coli and proteus. Um, and then you can actually combine your amino penicillins with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, so ampicillin, solbactam, or amoxicillin and clavulanate. And these are basically beta-lactamase inhibitors uh, to you know, further broaden the spectrum of the antibiotic. Uh, but what's also nice about these beta-lactamase inhibitors is that you start to get, get um, um, anaerobe coverage as well as some gram-positive, some gram-negative coverage. And then our anti-pseudomonal penicillins. Um, most commonly here in the United States, we have piperacillin or zosin. Okay, that's going to kind of be your, one of your workhorses in the emergency room when you need to cover pseudomonas. Um, it's got extremely broad gram negative coverage, okay, but again, you're not going to have any MRSA coverage. Um, you have some, you know, gram positive coverage, um, and then Zosin also has really good anaerobe coverage as well. So one thing that, you know, as a clinical pharmacist, I just think is super cool, but I'm kind of super geeky too, but, you know, Zosin, um, six, seven years ago, it was always given as a 30-minute infusion IV, and, um, you know, someone kind of came up with the smart idea is, hey, Zosin, it's a time-dependent killing antibiotic. Why don't we infuse Zosin over four hours? Same dose, same frequency, just infuse it over four hours instead of infusing it over 30 minutes because Zosin has a very fast half-life, so it gets out of your system really quickly. Okay, so by giving that four-hour infusion, okay, rather than a, you know, 30-minute infusion and coming out, it's actually been shown to reduce mortality in ICU patients with pseudomonas pneumonia. So I just think that is super cool to really optimize the pharmacokinetics of these drugs, and just by simply changing the way we administer an antibiotic over four hours rather than 30 minutes, we can treat patients better and reduce mortality. <clears throat> All right, next are cephalosporins, our first generation, such as ANCEF or cefazolin and Keflex. Um, again, their mechanism is pretty much the same. They're going to bind to the penicillin binding proteins of the bacterial cell wall, okay? Um, again, you're going to have, you know, pretty good gram-positive coverage with their first-generation cephalosporins, including Staph aureus, um, but not methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Um, our second generation, so we have our cefuroxime, um, so our 2A kind of upper body, our second generation 2B kind of our lower body, so cefoxetin, our cefamycins. The, nice, the reason why we separate the 2As from the 2Bs as far as second generation cephalosporins is because our um, cefoxetin and our cefamycins, they actually have anaerobe coverage. Um, so that's kind of nice when, you know, someone comes into the emergency room, 16-year-old kid, they got right lower quadrant abdominal pain, they got appendicitis, not ruptured, they need to go to the operating room, cefoxetin would be kind of your drug of choice as far as a pre-op, you know, antibiotic pr uh, prophylaxis. What you don't want to do is give advanced every single person who comes into the emergency room with uh, appendicitis, because we're starting to see such big resistance and uh, carbapenemase resistance everywhere, and it's because our surgeons just want to use nothing but advanced on everyone. All right, sorry, I'm going to stop ranting now. Okay. 
um, our third generation cephalosporins, so ceftriaxone or rocephin, um, and uh, Omnicef or cefpodoxime. Okay, um, you start to, again, we're starting to gain some pretty broad gram negative coverage. Uh, ceftazidime is also a third generation cephalosporin. Um, typically, third generation cephalos uh, cephalosporins don't have pseudomonas coverage. An exception is ceftazidime, actually can treat pseudomonas. Uh, but we actually don't really use ceftazidime a lot in adult patients. It's more commonly used in uh, pediatric hospitals. But rocephin is kind of one of our bigger workhorses in the emergency room as far as a third generation cephalosporin because it treats a lot of gram negative infections except pseudomonas. But sometimes, you know, just because something doesn't cover pseudomonas doesn't mean it's a bad thing. If someone's from a community, they're from home, they're not been in the hospital, they're not immunosuppressed, sometimes we don't want to uh, treat pseudomonas because they probably don't have it, and we want to save our anti-pseudomonals for when we really need them. Um, we actually have a new third generation of cephalosporin that just came out. Um, it's ceftazidine, which we already know about, but it's combined with a new beta-lactamase inhibitor, avibactam. And kind of the whole purpose of why this antibiotic got invented was to treat some of these newer drug-resistant um, bacteria, including KPC and ESBL organisms. Our fourth generation of cephalosporin, the um, cefepime. Okay, again, we get broader gram-negative coverage, and now we include pseudomonas coverage. You do not have any anaerobe coverage of cefepime, um, but just extremely broad gram-negative coverage. And um, now we actually have some new antibiotics out. We have a fifth generation cephalosporin out, ceftaroline, okay, which actually adds in MRSA coverage, which is quite interesting for a cephalosporin, uh, but you actually lose pseudomonas coverage. And, but again, this antibiotic hasn't really been super popular quite yet, um, you know, still restricted by a bunch of formularies. Um, and then we actually have a newer uh, fifth generation cephalosporin, Zerbaxa or ceftolazane. Um, and uh, this one again, it's pretty restricted, but we're starting to use it more and more because it is very good against some ESBO organisms, and these organisms are just becoming more and more common. Um, it's going to get really bad here in the next few years. I mean, as far as drug companies, all they want to do is make drugs for type 2 diabetes because millions of Americans have them and they're going to make a lot of money versus the rare patients that have these extremely resistant um, infections with resistant antibiotics. There's only a, literally a handful of new drugs on the market for, you know, treating these infections. So pretty soon here in the next five or 10 years, it's going to get really bad. <clears throat> All right, moving on to our carbapenem antibiotics. Now again, you can kind of see, um, here's a carbapenem, and you again have your core kind of beta-lactam ring structure here, but uh, you see a little bit of a different kind of ring structure here with your carbapenems, but what really separates the carbapenems and what makes them so good against and so broad coverage to treat a lot of things is these really funky side chains that they have here. And um, which comparing this to penicillin, um, you know, this is kind of the original penicillin here, but they don't really have any side chains here. And these side chains of these carbapenems are actually kind of what is designed uh, that they can pass through some of those channels and porins of those gram-negative bacteria that have the outer membranes there. So we have four different carbapenems. We got Invance or Ertapenem, uh, Primaxin or Imipenem, Meropenem, Doripenem, okay? And the biggest thing to remember about these is that imipenem, meropenem, and doripenem all have pseudomonas coverage, whereas ertapenem does not have any pseudomonas coverage. The reason I'm always talking about pseudomonas coverage and MRSA coverage is because these are your two most common hospital-acquired pathogens, okay, especially when treating like hospital-acquired pneumonia. So anytime we talk about antibiotics, we always want to say, does it cover MRSA? Does it not cover MRSA? Does it cover pseudomonas? Does it not cover pseudomonas? But once again, we kind of want to use this to our advantage sometime. If someone, you know, is from the community and they have a, you know, a life-threatening um, intra-abdominal infection, you know, they probably don't have pseudomonas if they're a healthy patient from the community, um, you know, so we don't need to use an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam antibiotic for this patient. We can use Envance that treats everything gram-negative and anaerobic, just not pseudomonas. Um, another thing about carbapenems just to watch out for is that they actually can lower seizure threshold and especially primaxin, so you just got to be cautious in doing high doses in patients with a history of seizures. And again, these are the drugs that are the drug of choice for ESBL producing organisms. And then our monobactam, astreanam, um, kind of the claim to fame to astreanam is that if you have 
an allergy to penicillin or cephalosporins, you can safely give as Trianam with essentially 0% cross-reactivity. Um, there is one exception, and that is if you have a ceftazidime allergy, a third-generation cephalosporin allergy, 60% of people will have a reaction to as Trianam. That's kind of interesting, but we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Next are fluoroquinolones. So we got Cipro, Leviquin, moxifloxacin, okay? Their mechanism of action is to inhibit DNA gyrase. So again, they have to get very deep inside the cell. So these are gonna be more concentration dependent killing antibiotics, okay? To kind of point out some of the key differences between these, Ciprofloxacin does not treat streptococcus pneumoniae, okay? So that's kind of one of the reasons why Cipro is not considered a respiratory fluoroquinolone. Whereas levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, they do treat streptococcus pneumonia, the most common organism to, treat, to cause uh, community-acquired pneumonia, all right? Um, and then also Cipro and Leviquin, these are both renally cleared fluoroquinolones. So you gotta be you know, remember to renally adjust these medications. So if someone had chronic kidney disease and they had a, got a creatinine clearance of 25 and you normally dose Leviquin at 500 milligrams every 24 hours, how would you guys want to adjust this dose for this patient who has renal dysfunction? Knowing that fluoroquinolones, they need to inhibit DNA, so they need to get inside the cell, so they're a concentration-dependent killing antibiotic. Yeah, so you want to keep the same dose and just extend the interval, okay? Um, because, because of a concentration-dependent killing antibiotic, you want very high concentrations, okay? And then you just got to extend the interval. All right, next, um, aminoglycosides. Um, again, their spectrum of activity is pretty broad gram-negative coverage, but pretty much only gram-negative coverage you get from aminoglycosides. If you combine aminoglycosides with Beta-lactams, for example, you, they can synergistically treat gram-positive infections, but typically when we're using aminoglycosides, we're using it for gram-negative infections, including pseudomonas. So genomycin and tobramycin are your two kind of most common aminoglycosides. Um, amikacin is also an aminoglycoside. Again, their mechanism of action is to inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. So once again, they gotta get deep inside the cell. They're a concentration-dependent killing an antibiotic. All right. Uh, they're notorious for causing nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity. You gotta get pretty darn high concentrations to cause ototoxicity, but it's not out of the realm of possibility, especially people who are sent home, um, people who are on dialysis, and they just, you know, they need to be on six weeks of aminoglycoside to treat whatever type of infection they have. Um, and uh, another interesting thing about aminoglycosides is that they actually inhibit motor transmission at the, at the motor end plate, neurotransmission at the motor end plate. And so all aminoglycosides are contraindicated in any patient who has a neuromuscular disorder such as myasthenia gravis. All right, aminoglycoside dosing. It gets, uh, you know, this is kind of one of the things a lot of people worry about, you know, and it is quite tedious, I'll be honest with you. You gotta give, you know, traditional dosing, you gotta give doses, you gotta check peak levels, you gotta check trough levels, um, and you gotta get it just right, and you gotta adjust the dose by a little bit here, a little bit there, adjust the frequency. Um, but, um, you know, in the emergency room, kind of one of the nice things is that, again, we just kinda gotta get patients started, gotta give them one dose. But again, I wanna make sure we get them, you know, an adequate dose. Remember, the mechanism of action, concentration dependent um, killing. Uh, the higher the concentration, the more effective it is. Okay, so we've actually developed some more modern dosing strategies for aminoglycosides. Um, these modern dosing strategies are called high dose um, or extended interval aminoglycoside dosing. Okay, and basically what this is is tobramycin or genomycin, five to seven milligrams per kilo given every 24 hours, rather than your traditional two to three milligrams per kilo given um, you know, every eight hours or one milligram per kilo every eight hours. So what these studies kind of show with this extended interval aminoglycoside dosing is that you give a super high dose, seven milligrams per kilo of tobramycin, you get really high concentrations, so it works better. But what's also interesting is that around that 18 hour mark of giving a tobramycin seven mg per kg Q24, the drug is actually completely washed out of the system. And you actually have the six to eight hour period of no drug in the body. But what's cool about 
aminoglycosides is they have this thing called a post-antibiotic effect, where even though the measurable serum concentrations of the aminoglycoside is negligible, you can't even measure it, the drug is actually still working, okay? But that's because all the drug is diffused into the bacterial cell. And so you don't actually measure any free genomycin or topromycin in the serum. Okay, so what also this has shown, this kind of washout period, is that this high dose or extended interval dosing, we worry, oh, geez, we're going to give a huge dose of aminoglycosides, we're going to cause a bunch of nephrotoxicity. Well, what's cool is we've actually seen it causes less nephrotoxicity. So they're more effective and less toxic by giving these high extended interval doses, okay, because you get that washout period. The problem is we haven't really studied doing this in patients who are over 80 years old or patients who have some severe acute renal failure. <clears throat> or you can just consult your you know, pharmacist to help you dose some immunoglycosides. All right, our macrolide antibiotics, such as azithromycin and clarithromycin, their mechanism of action is to you know, bind and inhibit protein synthesis in the bacterial cell. They have pretty good broad coverage, some gram positive, some gram negative. Uh, but what's also important about um, your macrolides is that they have um, your atypical coverage as well, such as Legionella and Mycoplasma. And um, they got a lot of GI intolerance, especially uh, clarithromycin, but what's also about biaxin or, or clarithromycin is that it's a strong inhibitor of CYP3A4 system, so a lot of drug interactions with clarithromycin. Our uh, glycopeptide antibiotics, so most commonly vancomycin, um, basically, it's a um, inhibits cell wall synthesis, okay, by binding to the D alanyl, D alanyl part of the bacterial cell wall. And IV vancomycin, it's strictly gram positive coverage, okay, including MRSA. Vancomycin is truly your workhorse um, for wanting to cover MRSA. Um, then you can give PO vancomycin again to treat C. diff. Um, some clinical pearls, again, it's a very large. Um, glycopeptide antibiotic is not going to cross, cross any uh, big membranes, so you can't give it PO to treat systemic infections. But also vancomycin, because of the large peptide nature, it doesn't really cross into CSF all that well. Okay, even though we still need to use it empirically to treat meningitis, um, that just kind of shows you that you need to give extremely high doses to really kind of get some good CSF penetration of vancomycin. Um, you want to maintain trough levels of vancomycin around 15 to 20 micrograms per ml or milligrams per liter um, for your more severe infections, okay? And this is kind of a newer development here in the last 10 years or so as far as targeting these higher uh, trough levels of vancomycin. And, um, you know, because, you know, we have this thing called an MIC creep of this MRSA is just becoming more and more resistant to vancomycin, uh, but also our specific infections that we're treating. If you're treating cellulitis, you know, just of your skin, you can, you can get away with trough levels of 10 or 15 with vancomycin because it distributes in the skin tissue and soft tissues really well, whereas uh, pneumonia, for example, vancomycin actually doesn't distribute into lung tissue all that well, only about 50% relative to serum. So you need to really push your doses and give high doses and have elevated trough levels, 15 to 20, if you really want to treat a pneumonia with vancomycin. Some of our newer glycopeptides, the reason I'm mentioning these, uh, dalbavancin and ortovancin, I want to run these by you. These are some new antibiotics that just came out within the past year or so. Um, I think they're going to be big in emergency medicine here in the next couple years. Okay, kind of what these antibiotics are all about is that they're basically vancomycin with a half-life of two weeks. Okay, and so how many times have we seen a patient come to the emergency room, um, you know, they got diabetes or they got peripheral vascular disease, they have a staph infection on their leg that's not getting better with their oral therapy, and we got to admit them to the hospital um, for IV antibiotics, okay? So that's kind of the whole purpose of why these new drugs were made is you give one dose in the emergency room, and then these patients are covered with an IV antibiotic that's going to treat MRSA for two weeks. All right, the problem is right now is, you know, we don't want to overuse these and give them to everyone. And also the insurance companies aren't really paying for it yet I mean, because they would rather pay, you know, $10,000 for a patient to stay in the hospital for a week versus pay $3,000 for a single dose of an antibiotic and send them home, which is kind of, you know, one of the reasons why we got a difficult healthcare system here in the United States and, you know, one of the worst when it comes to dollars spent to care given. If you spend a lot of money, you can have the absolute best care in the world, uh, but you got to spend a lot of money. All right, vancomycin dosing in the emergency room. Remember, vancomycin is both time and concentration dependent, area under the curve, okay? So it's not just one or the other, kind of a combination of both. 
maintenance doses of vancomycin around 15 to 20 milligrams per kilo, okay? And true loading doses of vancomycin around 25 to 30 milligrams per kilo. So again, if you're treating cellulitis, you probably don't need to give that patient a, a loading dose of vancomycin because vancomycin distributes into skin tissue really well. Versus if you're treating a meningitis, uh, vancomycin very poorly distributes into CSF. So you won't really want to give that patient a true loading dose of vancomycin around 25 to 30 milligrams per kilo. But for the majority of patients, the majority of things you're going to be treating in the emergency room, you know, 20 milligrams per kilo of actual body weight is going to be sufficient for most patients. Just remember, one gram of vancomycin for everyone does not work. All right, clindamycin. Um, clindamycin, again, uh, binds to the 50S ribosomal some unit, so it's got to get inside the cell. It's got pretty good coverage, um, mostly gram positive, some gram negative. Clindamycin is really good against strep, um, and it's also pretty good against staph, including MRSA. Um, Clindamycin, though, it can actually develop resistance, even if you get a, you know, a culture back that says sensitive to clindamycin and it's Staph aureus or MRSA, and you start treating with just clindamycin. If you're not doing high enough doses, the bacteria can actually develop resistance during the middle of the infection. Um, Ken, how much time we got? Uh, five minutes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, metronidazole, again, we kind of talked about the um, enterohepatic circulation, and... Um, you can give it IV, PO, daptomycin. I uh, just want to real quickly, you know, remind you that daptomycin cannot be used to treat any type of pneumonia. So what you're going to see is a patient who's on daptomycin, for example, for a um, osteomyelitis, and they come into your emergency room and they have pneumonia. Yeah, what you don't want to say is, oh, they're already on dapto, so they're covered for MRSA. No, they're not, as far as pneumonia. You still need to give that patient vancomycin to treat, you know, to cover for MRSA. Sulfonamide antibiotics uh, such as Bactrim, okay, very good broad gram positive coverage, including MRSA, and it's still got great MRSA coverage. Um, I want to hurry up through a couple slides here because I want to talk about, about the penicillin allergy and cross reactivity in the back here. Um, tetracyclines, you got your doxycycline and minocycline. These have pretty good gram positive coverage. They actually cover MRSA really well, actually around like 90 some percent is what our antibiogram says. Um, but they actually don't have great strep coverage. And then some of our miscellaneous antibiotics, so macrobid, nitrofurantoin. Um, it's going to be kind of one of your workhorses for treating uh, uncomplicated urinary tract infections. Uh, the one thing you want to be careful about with uh, macrobid is uh, don't want to use it near the time of delivery in a, 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 a pregnant patient because it can cause hemolytic anemia in the newborn. Otherwise, macrobid is kind of your drug of choice in uh, UTI and uh, uh, pregnancy. It's a very big molecule. It's renally cleared. Um, so if patients have renal dysfunction, the drug doesn't really get down in, into the bladder very well. So you can't use macrobid to treat a UTI in someone who has renal dysfunction. And then we kind of got a couple graphs here of the different antibiotics that cover MRSA and the different antibiotics that cover Pseudomonas. Again, those are just very important and your different antibiotics that have atypical coverage. So, you know, kind of use these charts and use these graphs. Um, all right, penicillin allergy and cross reactivity. Okay, 10% or one of every 10 patients that walk into your emergency room are gonna um, say that they're allergic to penicillin. Of these, though, only about 10% truly have a penicillin allergy. But these allergies can range anywhere from a minor rash to, you know, full-blown anaphylaxis or Stevens-Johnson syndrome, okay? The true incidence of a type 1 hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis to any antibiotic or any drug for that matter is around 0.01%, around 1 in 10,000, okay? Um, remember, just a quick allergy pathophysiology review. Your type 1 is IgE mediated, so they're antibody mediated reactions, okay? Your type 2 can be IgG or IgM, type 3, same thing. And then your type 4 is kind of your delayed T cell mediated reactions. Your type 1 anaphylaxis, that's kind of what we worry about the most because it is, you know, quite common, um, you know, compared to other things. And, um, you know, and it can be life threatening as well. 
So anaphylaxis is a type 1 hypersensitivity, IgE mediated. So basically the theory goes, uh, the first time you get exposed to penicillin, for example, um, your body sees that and it doesn't like that. So it creates these antibodies against that. Okay, so you actually don't have a reaction your first time that you get exposed to penicillin, okay? But your body creates and gets sensitized and creates all these antibodies that are floating around. So the next time you get exposed to penicillin, you already have these antibodies floating around. They can actually bind to the penicillin and cross-link on the mast cells and cause this mast cell degranulation where it releases histamine and all these vasoactive substances. And um, that's what actually causes the vasodilation. So you get the hives, you get the itchiness. And then if it's severe enough, it actually causes hypotension. And um, that's when it causes, starts to cause organ dysfunction, and that can be anaphylaxis. So when we look at the difference between amoxicillin and cephalexin, okay, a first-generation penicillin, a first-generation um, cephalosporin, you can see that they actually have very similar side chain structures here, okay? Um, and what's interesting, this is kind of some new data here in the last like five, 10 years as far as the, you know, the science behind penicillin allergy and cross reactivity is that um, penicillins, this ring structure here is actually tends to be very stable and kind of hangs around for a long time. Um, and so because of this ring structure combined with this side chain, your body kind of sees penicillin and says, I don't like that. I'm going to produce some antibodies against that. And so a lot of people truly do have, you know, allergies to uh, penicillins, whereas cephalosporins, allergies to cephalosporins are much less common. And one of the reasons is because this kind of six membered ring structure here of cephalosporins is very unstable and it actually breaks down very quickly um, once you give it. And so if someone truly is allergic to a cephalosporin, it's going to be due to the side chain alone and pretty much nothing to do with that core beta lactam structure. That's why so many more patients are allergic to penicillins rather than cephalosporins. <clears throat> so as we kind of talked about, you get exposed to penicillin, you create these IgE antibodies, okay? Um, the thing is, these IgE antibodies, they actually clear out of your system at a rate of around 10% per year or so. So around after around 10 to 15%, Okay, you actually don't even really have any of these Ig antibodies floating around anymore. So if you get re-exposed to penicillin after 15 years, um, you're actually not going to have any type of reaction, but your body is going to resensitize itself and create those Ig antibodies again. Okay, um, so we can kind of use this information to our advantage. So if someone has a penicillin allergy when they were, you know, 30 years ago, and they come in and they have a urinary tract infection, and we want to know if we can give them ceftriaxone, a third generation cephalosporin that looks totally different as far as the side chains, um, different side chains here. And again, we don't have to worry about the core beta lactam structure with ceftriaxone compared to penicillin. Um, the chance of cross reactivity between these are theoretically zero. Okay, it's about one in 10,000, which is the same as someone who doesn't even have an allergy to have a reaction to one of these antibiotics. Here's a nice little chart here that kind of shows, you know, all the different cephalosporins and which ones have a similar side chain to amoxicillin. And so some legal issues. What about that one in 10,000 patient that comes in? They had a penicillin allergy when they were a child and then you give them ceftriaxone and they still had an allergy. They were just that one in 10,000 patient, which you're gonna see that one in 10,000 patient, you know, in probably four or five years of working in the emergency room and giving all these patients antibiotics, okay? well. Real quick, there's, <clears throat> because the package insert, if you read the package insert, it says, Ceftriaxone, it says, do not give to anyone with a beta-lactam allergy. You know, that's just such a broad statement, and really, you know, if we abide by all these rules exactly, we're not going to be able to give patients anything. So there was this one case where a pregnant female, she had this very drug-resistant sinusitis. She was being treated with like amoxicillin and things and uh, wasn't really working. And um, they got a culture and it turned out to be drug-resistant haemophilus influenza. And um, even though she was pregnant, you know, the physician recommended, hey, let's give you a short course of Leviquin. It's a pregnancy category C. It's not the best thing, but if we don't get the sinusitis under control, you can get really sick. You can get meningitis from that. And so she agreed. Um, and she took one dose of Leviquin and actually had an anaphylactic reaction, um, had to be hospitalized, lost the baby. Um, and so if you can imagine, this kind of went to court and everyone was sued. Um, it actually went all the way to the Supreme Court and the, they were saying, hey, you shouldn't have given this person Leviquin because it says right here in the package insert, um, shouldn't be used in pregnancy. Um, had nothing to do with the, the allergy or any type of thing like that. And it was actually overruled um, that the package insert does not 
represent the standard of care, okay? The current evidence-based medicine does, okay? So just because things say something in the package insert, um, you know, you gotta truly use the most current, up-to-date evidence-based medicine. And uh, all right, so next time we'll talk about which antibiotics to use and uh, to treat different types of infection. So, thank you.